Dishonor on you. Dishonor on your cow. The meta narrative of Mulan, the character, and the movie trying to meet expectations. Stay tuned. Good day and welcome to Writers Get Animated, a podcast about animation, storytelling, and bringing honor to live action. I'm Chris Leva. And I'm Mackenzie Worrell. And today we're discussing Mulan, parentheses 2020, in relationship with Mulan, parentheses 1990s. I can't remember exactly what year it was in 19... I feel like it was 8, 98? Yeah, it's in that it's in that golden spot of the 90s of like the 96 to 99 run. That was really the peak of civilization. I think it was 98. I feel like it was. Maybe I'm just doing that because of 98 Degrees and the song True to Your Heart from oh, yeah. Stevie Wonder and that 98 was Degrees. Yes, 1998. Quite Boom! People would have saved us this problem, but we didn't Google. We didn't Google. We just were um, winging it, um, much like a falcon uh, who has wings, or or phoenix. I would have said, um, but yeah, a falcon or yes, phoenix yeah. are also acceptable. <laughs> Those are birds. <laughs> a phoenix is a bird. Um, <clears throat> I want to start off by saying. In regards to Mulan 2020, there are lots of geopolitical and human rights things which we could be discussing, but Chris and I are not most qualified to discuss. So please go listen to other people for that stuff. And today we're going to just focus on the story of the movie and just know there is other stuff to be said that is important and true, um, but there are better people than we to say that. I think that's a good way of putting it. We we are not that podcast. Yeah, we're about animation that. and storytelling. And I know Mulan 2020 doesn't have animation per se, but it's based on an animated movie. And I, I think there is expectation with these live action adaptations of Disney classics. Animated classics. Still feels I think weird to call Mulan a classic to me because it happened in my lifetime, but I guess it is like more than 20 years ago at this point. 22. 22 years old. Is it a classic if it's more than 20 years old? Is that what we're going with now? I don't know. Um, I think in I think we could call it a classic because it's not now. <laughs> it's not now. Zootopia is a classic. Yeah, the Disney classic Zootopia. I think I think people could get away with the Disney classic Frozen. Maybe we're a couple maybe we're too close to that one. Yeah, I don't know if I'm prepared to go classic with that yet. It's still too close. Anywho, uh <laughs> Mulan's is, there are two of them now. Two Disney ones. Um You'll notice earlier I said that Mulan 2020 is uh, based on an animated film. And you could argue that it's based on um, a myth of Chinese folklore. Um, and you wouldn't be technically wrong. Uh, but this movie's based on an animated movie and not a myth of Chinese folklore. Right. It is one step removed from its actual source material. The source material to this movie is... Mulan from 1998. Mm -hmm. That's what it's adapting. And it references it's, that in many meaningless ways that if you've never seen the 1998 film, we'll go right over your head and that's fine. If you see the 1998 film, you'll just wonder, why is this here? I don't mind it, but it's not saying anything in this movie. Right. They're Easter eggs. And not all of them are visual Easter eggs either. They're... Mostly audio, but we'll, we'll talk through those a little bit. 
yeah, that's my big sticking point, the audio. I Broadly, I don't think that a Disney live action or otherwise photorealistic remake of <laughs> an animated classic needs to have the songs and music of the film it's based on. I think it's totally okay mm-hmm. to drop that. That may be a hot take. I don't need the songs of Mulan in a new Disney Mulan movie. But they walk this the half songs... line. <laughs> yeah. I was about to make a snide comment about no, please, I don't know ahead. if the I don't know if the original Mulan needed the songs from Mulan. But they the are end. great. Does here's the, the, the Mackenzie take. Does any musical need the songs? Oh, okay. I forgot that you you go there. I, I set you up to go the one step further. Let's remove music from musicals or yeah. songs from musicals. Yeah. I, yeah. Let's, okay. We're going to pull back just slightly. And we're going to, let's, let's talk through this. I, I just want to talk through live action adaptations just in general we've talked about a couple of them or we we haven't so much talked about the live action versions but we have no we have we've uh, done lion king we did lion king we talked about um jungle book whether it was an animated film or not yeah um we talked about beauty and the beast by just watching the original one again um <laughs> We yeah. didn't really even really watch the live action version of that. So um, I guess this is our first time really comparing like a true live action remake, not a photorealistic, photorealistic animation remake to the animated film. Right. Right. Looking at it on its own because it is live action. We kept the rule of, is it animated? If it's animated, we'll, we'll talk about it. So that's why we talked about jungle book. And that's why we talked about, Lion King, because those are still animated to look like live action. Um, but Aladdin, we didn't discuss because that was mostly live action. And now we just wanted to discuss Mulan because Mulan doesn't get enough conversation. And as a side note, since you brought up Aladdin, I do want to say that I think that it is the best and purest expression of what these remakes should be and need to be that Disney has put out so far. And I would call Aladdin the best example to compare to. Yeah, that is the the high point of what they're doing. I I was talking about this with a few people, and I don't believe that these live action remakes are out to replace in anyone's imagination the original animated film. I think that's an impossibility. You cannot do that. The animated films are so ingrained in our understanding and DNA culturally that I don't think these films could possibly imagine taking the place of them. I think they are good dialogues with the current time and those experiences of watching those old films and giving us, hopefully, (laughs) stronger characters and stronger representation in whatever ways that those that manifests. If- I agree with that for people who have seen the animated original. Yes. I, I do think, I know it's hard for the Disney people listening. I want to imagine the world um, where for the people who haven't seen the Disney animated movie, not just in Mulan, but in general, um, because I want to talk about who this film is for. Because to me, I think the general idea is that this film is for people who haven't seen the animated movie more generally than people have seen the animated movie. I think that's true of all of these remakes. It's trying to expand the audience like you have, like a fairy tale, except Disney owns the fairy tale now. Um, (laughs) Because you have Hansel and Gretel in like, 15 ways and that's how something takes root in the culture of like the different interpretations and ideas of a myth and Disney's putting a stake in saying like here's the fork in the road the myth is ours now and we can expand on our take on this myth and make that its own myth 
and tell it in a new way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it also goes against, no, it goes not against, it goes, it coincides, that's the word I'm looking for, with when Bob Iger took over, his three priorities for Disney that he laid out were to invest in high quality content from really creative people. So that's why he, that's when you see Pixar, Marvel, and Lucasfilm being purchased. And then his second goal was to use technology to be more innovative. So that's why we have Disney Plus. That's why I think we have Jungle Book. And that's why we have Lion King. Um, and then to grow globally. So we're not just reaching for an American audience, we're reaching globally. That's why you have Shanghai Disney. And I think that's why we have the version of Aladdin we have and this new version of Mulan that we have. Yeah, because I think at a more base level, you want to ask who are these movies for? Or it might be better compared to who the, who the original movies were for. Mm-hmm. And I would say that the original movies were for an American audience. And I don't think that that's necessarily debatable. It was great that they could make money on them globally, but I don't think they were made with a global eye. I read something really insightful that I won't take credit for. It was someone on the internet, and I wish I could give them credit. I forget who it was. Uh, but it was someone saying that the 1998 Mulan was made for an Asian American experience audience. So it's still made for Americans. I could see their points of what they were saying. Um, I am not the best person to assess whether or not that's true. I think Mulan 2020 may be geared toward a mainland China audience. And we can debate whether or not that succeeds at that goal. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's definitely not geared toward an American or an Asian American audience now. Hmm. I think Disney's still expected to make money on that here. I, I, I can't even say what they really expected. Um, I don't know. It feels like in general with a lot of Disney films recently, especially after the advent of the Marvel cinematic universe, the films are geared toward pleasing everyone in the world at all times, always. And I don't know if that's a successful way to make a story. You want to make something broad and approachable, but are there, I don't want to say just too many cultures, too many cultures with money (laughs) that Disney's trying to appeal to that are too different to have one broad movie with one broad message and how it plays that message apply to all of them. And that's okay. Hmm. And I wonder what that does in terms of specificity of character and time and place in a film and what that being so specific to make it relatable versus being generalized to make it relatable. And I think we always think that being generalized will get us there when really the specificity is what pulls out the humanity. And that's the weird, um, what is it where you think something and that the wrong, the other thing, the opposite thing is true. God, what is that? Reverse psychology? (laughs) No, not the, not reverse psychology, but I can't think of that word. It's the, it's the strange thing where we believe that being general will be the thing that creates the a general appeal when it's really being as specific as possible to a very, very specific experience and character and place that creates for the general understanding that we can see all of humanity in that one person. And who is seeing all of humanity in that one person, too? Um, Mm -hmm. We do live in a much more global world now than we did 22 years ago. That's absolutely true. Um, And I think that in many ways, that's good. And that's uh, a scab that I'm not going to pick at right now in this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) 
That's a right. different non-animation podcast topic. Um, but I think that the idea of like what is a universal human message can be specific to certain broad cultures as well. Um, and while I don't think that the human experience is like fundamentally different in any part of the globe at this point, I think that a lot of the same broad stuff affects everyone everywhere. And we all have very broad challenges as humans, but how we identify what a universal message is can still be different because you have arguably the Judeo Christian, very ingrained idea of like guilt being a driving force for how humans behave in very air quotes added here, the Western world. Um, And I think you have shame as a driving force in air quotes, the Eastern world to a certain degree. And that's what both Mulan's hit at of this idea of shame and dishonor. And some of them are more successful than others. I think fundamentally the 1998 Mulan is Again, quoting this person speaking to an Asian American experience where it's like justifying this idea of your family believing in shame and dishonor in a world where you know that you live in this different world now. And what does that look like? And how do you blend these two ideas together and not have dishonor for your family, but express yourself in a way that is different? And New Mulan, I think, is dealing with the idea of shame as a driving force and the fear of bringing dishonor to yourself and your family and your country, and then kind of accepting how do I behave inside the diagram that I've been given um, as a special exception to what brings dishonor to people without fundamentally changing the world or my family. Hmm. I'll have to sit and think with, think about that for a while. Not not as we're recording, you know, like in silence for a while. <laughs> 20 minutes of silence with writers get animated. As we think and ponder through that and the ramifications of what you just said. Yeah, so there's a lot there. And I think that for a lot of American audiences, the idea of the shame being a driving motivator in Mulan 2020 and its story may not resonate as much, but it's still there and we get it, but it's not as core as it might be for the mainland China audience, but also like the creative team behind this movie is mostly American still. (laughs) So what is fundamentally different between these two things? Um, They are, they tell the same story. If you are listening to this podcast because you're wondering, should I pay the extra money to watch it now before it comes out on Disney plus in December. I don't know if you may be able to answer that through our conversation. We'll try to be non spoilery Uh, at the beginning. We'll let you know when we're going to get more spoilery. Um, But I think there are some things to know. We already alluded to the fact that there are no sung songs in this. Um, there's no wise cracking dragon in this. And I think that probably answers nine tenths of the questions people have about <laughs> whether they would watch it or not. And um, I, I do want to endorse this and say like, this is a movie that I enjoyed watching. I enjoyed paying the extra money for and seeing a movie that I have not seen in the year 2020. Um, I do give a vote of like, Yes, this was fine and I watched it. Um, Did I love it? No. Do I think it was bad? Parts of it. Uh, (laughs) But I would recommend it to people to watch. In summary. I think um, my wife at the end of it, she said, she's like, why don't people don't like this? So I thought it was good. She's like, I liked it. Yeah. And... I am of the same mind. You know, it was a good movie. And there are, I think there are things that we can talk about as writers about expectations and the expectations that you have to deal with of what your audience is expecting to receive from you and how you deliver and subvert or ignore 
those expectations. And or in the case I, of Mulan, half deliver for people who care. Right. <laughs> and not even half deliver. I think it's like sprinkle, you know. It's like they they served you a plate and they come over and they're like, do you want cheese on this? And they're like, yes, shredded cheese. Okay. And then they went, shush, shush. And instead of giving you shredded cheese until you said, okay, that's enough. They just give you one little shaving of cheese and then they'll walk away from your meal. It's like, wait, but I wanted more. Where's, nope, nope. And I know it's problematic to talk about Italian food um, <laughs> while we discuss Mulan probably, but. I'm not morally opposed to change, and I think some people, as is a problem with fan culture right now in general, some people feel really emotionally attached and entitled to something that delivers what they want. And I think that you see this in the Disney fandom, too, with Lion King being a shot-for-shot remake, and people going, I don't want that, that's bad, and then Mulan not having enough of the remake in it, and people going, I don't want that, that's bad. Um <laughs> <laughs> fans are different and disparate and this isn't the same fan i think in most cases saying that about both movies but um two different loud groups of fans who aren't pleased because you can't win with nostalgia it's a way to make money but it's not a way to make people happy <laughs> mm. because people you're dealing with whether those people have watched mulan since the year 1998 <laughs> And remember it very clearly in one way um, versus the people who have kept up with watching Mulan. You know, I've seen it a few times. Like I've seen Mulan four or five times. I even watched it once in Mandarin just for kicks because I liked the movie so much. I, that was a fun experience to hear um, Jackie Chan sing. That was that's that's pretty cool. Like that's have that experience. Put your DVD on mandarin and listen and watch mulan you, it's a totally different movie um i mean not totally but you know some of mushu's wisecracks you don't know what it's actually saying but it's still silly <laughs> um but i think what can we do as audience members when we are approached with a remake or a reboot you know or even even continuations of stories that we love that where we think we know where they're going and then the movie tells us this is not going to go the way you expect like <laughs> how do we as fans and audiences make ourselves okay with that yeah it's not fun to make something that's just the exact same thing but in HD like I don't know if fans just expect like video game ports. Like it's this game, but now it's in HD with movies. Like that's not with video games. I think it's different because there are people programming it and doing that. And that's still enjoyable work and a challenge and unique in its own way, but it's not fun to just make a movie that you love, but so it looks different. Yeah. Cause every time you're doing when, which what they're essentially doing is they're making an adaptation and an adaptation has to have a reason for existing now. So why this story? Why these characters? Why this moment? And if the answer to all three of those is money, 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 you may have to do a little bit more um, to go Mulan on this. You might have to have a little bit more reflection in there. Well put. Thank you. But I, I don't think for Disney that it is money, money, money. I think some decisions might be made there because there's the business side and there's the artistic side to this. And it's nice to revisit the Disney Renaissance again. Even if these movies being in theaters make me go back and rewatch the originals, how long has it been since you've seen the original? Oh, great. I get to go back and relive it. You know, I get to see it in a new way. And I did rewatch it after seeing the 2020 film. And you know what? I didn't just see it in a new way. I was so grateful for it in a new way. Because <laughs> like, so getting back 
to the, the, I think, a question we were talking about earlier before we get into the spoilery, what we liked, what we didn't like section of this episode. Mm. Um, what is the story of Mulan? And I think that the 1998 movie in like one to two sentences is, it's a story about a girl who defies expectations to try to save her family in a secret way. And she's afraid of being caught out in that. But what she ultimately learns is that by being herself and using her talents, uh, she can save not just her family, but the country of China. And I think Mulan 2020 is about a girl who feels that she has to hide her magical special talents that make her better than everyone else and conform into the world and learns that um, you can use your magical special talents it, to help conformity and everyone will forgive you for that. And that may be a harsh take. Um, but I feel like that's the summary. Would you agree or tweak that in any way? I agree. I think there is, there are two things that I would add to that. I think the, Mulan 1998 is all that you said. And then, but also the story of somebody coming into their potential mm. and growing into discovering and working to become the person that she has the possibility of being. She, she doesn't know whether she could be a great warrior and she's not even trying to be a great warrior she's just trying to stop her father and protect her father she's trying to be the best daughter she can be by protecting the life of her father mm -hmm. and through that decision she realizes no i do have this other thing where it's not about him it's about <laughs> me and 2020 Mulan is, um, I have to be a good daughter. Um, so let me hide what I have, as you said, but it, it changes to being, uh, it's like Captain Marvel. Like I've been fighting with one hand behind my back this whole time. And now let me show you my true power as opposed to somebody who didn't realize the power was there and has to work for it. Yeah. And I do want to say that I think Mulan 2020 is a different genre than Mulan 1998, mm -hmm. but it's new genre and what you're expressing right now, um, I think is a misunderstanding of the genre that it's trying to be, <laughs> which just leads to extra criticism because the so trappings. Yeah. I was gonna say let's let's go there. Let's go with what what genre are we in? Mulan 2020 is a wuxia like martial arts film. Yeah, it's the story of Disney's Mulan in a genre. I don't want to say unique to China, but specific, uh, especially to East Asia. Uh, and wuxia is like the Chinese version of like this martial arts era like usually someone who's talented and not attached to like a military complex in some way like proving who they are and having like this martial arts stuff and i'm doing a terrible summary but i'll leave it there uh and i think that the disney mulan 1998 is in the trapping of an animated musical comedy <laughs> mm -hmm. so what they've stripped out when they've changed genres is what people keep asking about like is Mushu in it are the songs in it like no because that's not the genre that it's in and I don't mind that because that's a transformative experience of taking one story and getting an opportunity to do something new with it by putting it in a different genre and I don't know that everyone understands that at least on the American side because I don't think there's as much familiarity with Wuxia martial arts movies in the US I don't think so I mean in the I remember watching some of the nineties. Like, I think that, I think that's my understanding of them, but it, it is a different style and tone and feel immediately um, 
from the original Mulan. Uh, so you do get a feeling that, hey, this is this is not the Mulan that you're expecting. It it immediately is different. Yeah, they are very clear that if you're expecting the next two hours to change, it's not going to. Anywho, should we enter spoiler territory for anyone who still hasn't seen this? Uh, yes, let's. Whap, whap, whap. That's a terrible alarm sound. But we are hitting the alarm because it is now spoiler o'clock on Writers Get Animated. So if you're going to go see it anyway and want to be spoiled, that's fine. You're welcome to stay. If you want to go pay for the premiere access on Disney Plus and watch it before you listen to this, go for it. Otherwise, we'll see you in December. Uh, and you could listen to this episode then <laughs> after you've watched it on Dis- when it's released to Disney Plus for all users. Okay, so with spoilers being acceptable, Chris, let's start with what you liked. What was okay. good about this movie? Um, oh, that, it's a, I'm not signed because I'm going to say nothing because I think <laughs> I don't want that to be assumed. I think for me, there, uh, the best, there are so many beautiful moments in this. I think one thing I liked is just the, um, the cinematography is mm. really gorgeous and the scale. It feels epic from the very beginning. Yeah. You get a sense that it's big, it's beautiful, it's massive. There's a world here. I agree that the scale of the story is much bigger and has a much better understanding of the landscape of China because it was shot there. <laughs> Asterisk, see earlier note about geopolitical issues, and we're not discussing that here. But it shows a more diverse geography of China to give you a sense of the scale of how far these campaigns are going and what's going on. I loved the volcano fight. I thought that was super well shot. It was really pretty. Uh, and if you haven't yeah. seen it, saying volcano fight doesn't do it justice, but I, Chris, I assume you know what I mean. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was really, I, I think it's nice to see something done artfully and I feel like the eye, the the filmmaker's eye of this film, it feels different. Like it doesn't feel like. Um, I don't want to say that the Marvel Cinematic Universe feels like uh, generic actiony, um, <laughs> but it doesn't feel like a generic action movie. It feels like an action movie of a genre but it feels colorful and with life and like it has a style to it. Yeah. <clears throat> and I appreciated that it had that. I also enjoy seeing young Mulan. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I love, and you know that I love this kind of thing. I love good fathers. I, <laughs> I appreciate good, strong fathers who are trying to do the right thing and are not terrible people or taskmasters or, you know, I just want to see better representations of what a father can be. And here is somebody who is caring, obviously loving, obviously mentoring his daughter, obviously loves his family, but also understanding what is right and trying to do the best thing to take care of his family and handle his place in society. Yeah. I totally agree that I understand Mulan's motivation a lot more of like taking your father's place in the war in this one. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, he loves you. Okay. (laughs) You don't want him to die. I see. (laughs) I get it. It's about him. Which the 1998 one, it's fine and acceptable, but I feel like it's, there's a lot more substance and depth to that motivation in this movie. It, yeah, it lives in that relationship. Like that's that first Part, which I think we'll also talk about in our next <laughs> section. But, you know, it talks through, um, it builds them up as a duo. 
yeah. together. Spoilers for our spoiler section. I think a lot of things that I like about this movie get overused into the territory of not liking eventually. But the idea of them are things that I like, like Good Fatherland. I enjoy that part, that mm-hmm. idea. Um, I also, speaking, since we're in like the young Mulan flashback at the beginning, um, I want to talk about the thematic change to the Phoenix being the guardian instead of like any of the guardians you don't see in 1998 or Mushu. I like the motif of the Phoenix a lot better for what Mulan's story is. For this Mulan story? For either Mulan story. Mm. Can you say a little bit more about that? I am not as familiar with the Phoenix in Chinese folklore. I know it doesn't like burn up and get reborn. Um, but I think that it still represents like change in beauty. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that makes more sense as a thematic guardian than a generic dragon person thing. Sure. Yeah. It's like, cool, let's have a dragon in an animated musical comedy. I'm on board. I love Mushu, not disparaging Mushu. Um, yeah. Be careful. Tread lightly. Yeah. But the motif of the Phoenix, I think, is a good choice. And I additionally love that Mulan is the one who breaks the guardian statue and steps on its wing to break it. Is it executed well? Debatably. But I like the idea that she does it, <laughs> not Mushu breaking the guardian statue, because it says much more about Mulan breaking from tradition and breaking from her family's tradition. And it's more symbolically important and relevant. Hmm. I like that. Because I didn't remember until I rewatched 1998, like, oh yeah, Mushu breaks the dragon statue. <gasps> That's what they were doing in 2020 with the Phoenix statue. I like that now. <laughs> yeah. I do, I do like that there is a overarching theme of change and transformation and rebirth um, because you have to assume that at some point she will re- be reborn as who she's supposed to be. And spoilers, uh, well, that, I think that was a really exec- well-executed point mm-hmm. um, in the film. But there, I love that that's a, a through line going in there. I do like that they went with the Star Wars sequel trilogy idea that something powerful on the light side has to rise up to meet something powerful on the dark side, um, where they had a give Mulan a good foil on the opposite side. In that sentence, I will say that I really like the foil. Yes. <laughs> We'll get into the rise up and destiny part of it. Um, But yes, I also enjoy that this story has a second major female character. (gasps) Gasp. Um, Great idea. I love that essentially (laughs) Shen Hu's hawk became a character. I (laughs) right. (laughs) Like, cool. You're here. Uh, I think she's great. Uh, I understand that some of the words they use to describe her and how she does stuff might be kind of nonsense in the idea of the Chinese tradition. Um, but I don't have any problem with her powers. I thought that she was just walked that fine line of like, not quite too cheesy for me. It was cool. And like an affected goth dramatic theatrical nature without like being annoying I, I would agree. It took me a little bit out of it, though, because and, and this may be because of the expectations set by how real and grounded the, the movie was to start with. And then suddenly to get magic like that, it, it throws it threw me off just a little bit. I was like magic in Mulan. And then I remembered, <laughs> no, there's a whole talking dragon and ancestors and all this and. Like magic is totally a part of Mulan. So Mm -hmm. it's just, this is a different manifestation of the 
magic that we've seen. And I don't want to say they like tried to explain magic and whether we needed an explanation of magic or just the magic happening. I don't know. Sometimes I think we get too bogged down with needing an explanation, but I know that some of that explanation is necessary thematically for the story that they were specifically telling in this version of Mulan. I disagree with that. Um, oh, yay. I want to hear why. I I don't think you need an explanation for magic. I agree. The, the witch could just have magic and it would happen, and I'd be totally fine with that. I'm on board. It's okay. Um, and I generally like the idea of saying someone from the light is rising up to meet the powerful dark. That's okay. And where it falls apart for me is where they tried to like, we're getting into the dislike. Well, we'll return to more stuff we do like in a second, listeners. Um, <laughs> where it falls apart for me is where they tried to like, I don't think this is a, a bad thing in this universe either. Um, and I'm also fine with it in this other universe, but as a cultural reference where they give Mulan midichlorians um, and have this nonsense idea of what chi is like, they're saying like chi is for boy warriors and you have good chi and it's magically powerful inside of you. Like, and I think you sent me the, the gif of Han Solo going, that's not how the force works. Uh, (laughs) and that's not like if this movie is for viewers in mainstream China like that's not what chi is or how chi works Um, it's just kind of this nonsense loose thread idea to pull these two things closer together that ultimately like makes it less likable for me Mm. I don't think Mulan needs to have inherent natural magic talent I think that the driving force of Mulan for me is her finding her usefulness through her own skills and proving her worth, not by not hiding her magic Elsa style. I, mean, I did appreciate on in that line of thinking, I did appreciate a here is a character who is Mulan, but if it, she was taken advantage of yes, and abused and misused and, and been traumatized. There's that. And then he, Mulan is what you could do if you actually care for somebody and build them up and give them what they need, even if that's building them up and training them unknowingly. <laughs> but I think... You know, she had to get her talents in a way that was dishonest. And this other person lived as who she was and was traumatized for it and then abused and taken advantage of. And whether that could be done without chi, without magic, maybe, you know, here's a woman who wanted to go to war and had these powerful was able to be powerful and she's taken advantage of, and she is just used for wrong. And versus Mulan, who is athletic and fun and interesting and not really able to do the womanly things that she's supposed to do, but she's still celebrated and gets training. You know, that could still be interesting, but does that allow you to do fun, crazy stunts? I don't know. I don't know. I think the movie could be the exact same except minus the magic chi logic and it would work as good if not better for me. Right. The thing that's within you that is special about you that you are holding back showing doesn't have to be magic. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that you're more special than anyone else. It's just that be who you are. Yeah, to me, Be true like, to your heart. This came into being more about Mulan as a legendary hero, and less any woman could have been this hero of legend. Which is what 1998 Mulan yeah. creates. Hmm. 
to cleanse that palette because I promised getting into more stuff that I liked. I do also yes. want to say <laughs> I like the split of the love interest not being the commanding officer anymore. Mm-hmm. I liked that the love interest was a peer. I made it less workplace sexual harassment-y. Um, <laughs> and also then gave uh, a through-line father figure that there was no romantic interest in in the new commanding officer. It's like, so you have mm-hmm. your father at the beginning, your commanding officer in the middle, and the emperor at the end. There's always a father figure representing like who you look up to and who you want to be. And she has a different relationship that is the same troubles with all three of them. Um, so I really like that split of character. Wasn't expecting it, um, but I thought it was a very, very good choice. It was Even really if effective. the love interest didn't get to like have an ending. I... <laughs> no but I did also like to be really specific uh, the matchmaker scene where they're getting things set up for her and you just see it almost Wes Anderson style from above and you know all the ingredients to I just love little stylistic fun choices of here let's do this in an interesting way let's actually do this in a evocative moving moment Hmm. that I feel like was really, really strong. Hmm. And as you were talking through earlier, what we said about the Phoenix, the moment, and this is really spoilery, but uh, the, the adversary they're, they're together and the fight happens, like you said in the volcano and the, she gets hit with the dagger and she's saved because of her binding. And she said that's when her lie died. You know, that's when <laughs> the man that she was pretending to be dies and Mulan is reborn. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was a really strong deciding moment. It's not she got injured, she got found out, you know, the doctor like went in the tent and was like, um, that's a woman. <laughs> and everyone was like, yeah, you're a woman. She decides I'm done with the lie. I'm going to be myself. I'm going to, I'm going to live my truth and go out there as who I am. And yeah, such a stronger choice. Yeah. Because it, it she doesn't live in shame still at that moment. In Mulan 1998, she's shamed for yeah. the lie. Like, she's found out, and she doesn't get a chance to say. I mean, she gets a chance to redeem herself, but there's still so much shame in that moment of the, with the revelation. And this is, go ahead and kill me, because this is who I am. I'd rather you kill me than send me home to see my father. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Um, hmm. like, yeah, I, I, so they did good job, you know, Mulan 2020. Good job there. Adds a lot of depth there, which maybe is the goal of all these remakes in the first place of like adding depth to the weak spots and the definition of weak spot as seen by Disney varies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in this plot point. Yeah, I would, looking back at Mulan 1998, I would agree that that turning point after the avalanche is really like the weakest part of that film. We're just like, they found a way to get out of there. It was perfectly acceptable, but Mulan 2020 is a better, a better midpoint in every way. Mm -hmm. And it is the midpoint in, in 1998, that's, you're about, 20 minutes from the end. <laughs> yeah. And in Mulan 2020, you still have a long way to go. Like there's still a lot of movie left after that avalanche. Mm-hmm. Like what, what are they going to do? I thought we were heading to the final battle, the final climax. Like, yeah, we'll get there. It's a Wuxia okay. movie. You have to have like the one really tall gray corridor that no one can escape from. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have that scene, Chris, obviously. I know, silly me. Should we move into the things that are maybe uh, not so good? Sure. Let's. Let's dig in. 
as and I hinted some at of a, these, oh, I was go ahead. Say, some, and some of these are connected to our previous conversation. So, yeah, at a, at a high level, some of the things that I liked, I think, do get overused. At one point, it's like early on, like a Phoenix, what a great idea. And then by the last time the Phoenix shows up, I'm like, oh my God, let the Phoenix go away. <laughs> No one else can see. It. It's this magical, symbolic thing in the background. We as an audience got it. It's not adding anything to these scenes. I don't need the phoenix wings behind Mulan in the glinting sunlight as she's approaching the villain for the last time. Are you sure? Maybe if that's the only other time we got the phoenix. Maybe, yes. I, I would be done with the phoenix at the rebirth scene we just talked about. And I would be perfectly fine never seeing the phoenix again. It has served its purpose. Mm-hmm. Done. Um... The witch character, I don't really understand the end of her arc and plot. Maybe I need to rewatch the movie to get a better idea. I think it was really strong, but it was really rushed. And that was the problem with it. In yeah. a movie that takes its time, <laughs> it found a quick moment to get to this one thing that needed to happen. Yeah. And I really appreciated the switch, the turn, but it wasn't allowed to have the style and breath that so many other things were allowed to have. Ah, oh, just forget to wait. It can resolve both problems because she's already a bird witch. If you don't see the Phoenix again after the twist scene, then when she sacrifices herself or decides to, then you get a Phoenix motif there or like she becomes a Phoenix or something like that. There you go. Or see the Phoenix. I'm happy. Solve both problems. Two birds. Literally two birds. <laughs> One plot stone. <laughs> That's the end of the episode, everybody. <laughs> Every, yeah, I don't think we could do any more. I think we're done. I think I think we've peaked, and it's good to go out on a high point. As always, thank you to us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Um. I think another overused thing, uh, as much as I, I love young Mulan and the dad at the beginning, like the first 30 minutes being like Mulan's dad is the main character don't really make sense to me. I would love to see that from Mulan's perspective, not her dad's perspective. Um, also, why is the framing device Mulan's dad talking to his ancestors? Not descendants, to his ancestors. <laughs> yeah. And then that doesn't come back at the end? Yeah. You're That's right. That's a weak point. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. In, in conclusion, young Mulan would have been better. I just want to know what she thinks and see her perspective. Yeah. I don't think we needed the narration. We probably could have gotten away with not having it. And probably shortening that up. There was one moment, too, talking about time and breath. There was a moment where it suddenly becomes Mulan's story, um, where she's learning and doing everything. And it's a whole other movie about the soldiers and the time and war. And all of a sudden, it switches back to the, the evil clan. And I was like, Oh, yeah, the bad guys. <laughs> like, I forgot they were in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, oh yeah, the, here are the antagonists again. Like, it just, it forgets for a while. It's a movie with, um, I don't want to say amnesia, but it just, again, this is why I wondered about that ending turn. It just spends its time with, all right, let's develop this idea. Mulan is a child with her father. And now let's develop this idea of, Mulan, you know, as a soldier. And then it's like, now we're going to develop Mulan as a war hero. Now we're going to, it's, and then in between those, we'll have interstitials of the bad guys killing people. <laughs> Which is more screen time than the bad guys got in the original. Um, True. True. But there's more screen time for everyone in this movie, I guess. Yeah. Except oh. the Emperor's gay assistant. He's gone. Yeah. Good and bad? <laughs> we'll get into that, my favorite thing. Um, 
I'm trying to think what else about this movie. We've talked about some of that. Um, one thing that I really disliked at the end is after Mulan comes into her own and then the emperor still like has a moment to show that he's still more powerful than Mulan and stops the arrow and does this nonsense. Like I want this to be the movie of Mulan saving the emperor, not the emperor also being able to save himself once Mulan does that to allow him to save himself. Hmm. Like where he, where he catches the arrow that exact moment. Yeah. Yeah. Like if he were that powerful, like why did he need Mulan? To untie him. He was tied up. Mackenzie, he was tied up. I, I can't even No. I don't know. Again, I think that goes into what I think the core of Mulan 1998 is, is a woman proving that any woman could have saved the emperor in China. Right. And it just feels like that's constantly for me. I don't know if they, I don't know if the makers of Mulan 2020 had that same view of the core essence of Mulan 1998 as I do. And if they didn't, they, maybe made a film align with whatever core essence that they saw and wanted to preserve. Mm -hmm. Um, But at least my personal takeaway from Mulan 1998 is constantly undercut by Mulan 2020, even with all the good new stuff that they've added. Um, (sighs) It gets taken away. I mean, it's the fundamental theme of the movie. You know, it's, it's the way you construct the character and that's going to be totally at odds with every dramaturgical turning point <laughs> mm-hmm. you know every every theme if that's based on the the way that you've set up your character and and the theme that you're out there to say everything supports that so every no matter how good everything else is if your thesis is <laughs> is antithetical then you're just going to be continually reminded of that mm-hmm It's okay. It's okay. It is okay. I'll feel fine. (laughs) Is there anything else we want to say about things that were a little bit more problematic for us? Story-wise. Story-wise. I think that I've hit all my key points, but the one thing that I want to emphasize again, we talked a bit about earlier, is the music. Mm. Again, I think it's okay to have a version of Mulan without the songs. Mm-hmm. But then you can't have a light motif of the musical numbers from 1998 and have them have meaning in Mulan 2020 if you don't have the origins of those things. It doesn't mean anything to just have the when will my reflection show like musical bit when she's looking at the armor. Um, but you don't know where that's coming from. It's right. kind of a meaningless musical callback. Just give it new music and that's fine. Right. I mean, even in the matchmaker scene, we had that same, you'll bring honor to us all light motif playing underneath it. I was like, oh, this is how they're, this is how they're doing it. This is how they're paying their respects to what came before. Just every time I hear a bad musical cue to the film that it's a remake of, I just think of Christopher Walken going, I want to be like you, ooh, ooh. As King Louie in the Jungle Book. <laughs> this movie doesn't uh, need this. If you're going to cut it out, cut it out. And that's acceptable. Ooh. But please don't have to do it. Like, obviously, with every time you do one of these Disney, there is a group of fans who clamor and say, we want the music. And you haven't remade it with the music yet. And you're clearly not going to. So to stop half doing it because you know that doesn't make anyone happy. Yeah. Putting the soapbox uh, aside, that's the end of my key stuff. <laughs> is there anything more you want to touch on uh, in the not as happy category? I honestly don't think so. I think um, I personally, I mean, beyond what we talked about when we talked about she already, I think we, we hit those main thematic big questions. Why is this happening? Why is this like this? And I I think for me, 
the movie is good and strong. Uh, it's helpful if you've seen Mulan 1998, um, but it's not a family, fun, feel-good summer movie for everyone in the family to watch. It's pretty much, uh, you watch this in the 90s, now you're older, here's an action movie for you. With some of the some of the flavors from before, but really, I would not have felt comfortable with my eight year old watching it with me. Nothing terrible or grotesque happens. I think he just would have been bored. Yeah, it's geared toward an older child audience, if children at all. Right. Yeah, like 14, 14, 15. It, I don't think it works for anyone much younger than that. There's no silly slapstick. There's no, I mean, okay, there's some silly slapstick. Um, mm. There's some funny things, but it's not nearly, um, it is, it skews much older than Mulan 1998, which is not a bad thing necessarily. It's just something that you should know. Mm-hmm. And if you've gotten to this point in the episode, I not, hope you figured still it out. I'm not sure. I think you may have known. In conclusion, um, pay money to watch Mulan and you'll have a fine time. Mm-hmm. Or wait till December and still have a, have a really good time um, and watch it on your own on some weekend while you're folding clothes or something. Yeah. Or make a movie night, not with the family. Movie night just for you. Yeah. You don't need your family to watch the movie with you. It's Mulan. Just watch Mulan. Mulan's just a gateway drug, though, Chris. That's true. Uh, (laughs) I know we've talked about a lot of stuff we liked already, but did you have a favorite thing in Mulan 2020? Honestly, I think my favorite thing is... um, Where, where, where was it? It was, it was the rebirth scene, mm-hmm. I think, with a very close second being the the shot of the materials to get her ready for the matchmaker. I don't know why I like that shot so much. I was just like, oh, they're just appearing. I don't know what it was. <laughs> it just, it was just a really delightful moment, um, mm-hmm. and I just live for that. That's fair. Um, cause I didn't have a good reason to talk about it before. I will say my favorite thing is, um, still keeping in some of the undertones of the unintentional LGBTQ icon that Mulan is from the nineties movie emphasis on unintentional, but they knew they couldn't get rid of that. And they also couldn't portray that overtly for China. So you have like a weird, when the soldiers are sleeping in bed together, one of them tries to hug Mulan. She's like, no, and forces them away. And they just have like two happy male soldiers cuddling up at night. Like, oh yes, it's so cute. It's acceptable. China will take it. They won't edit it out. <laughs> and later when um, the witch bird is putting her hand on Mulan's shoulder and saying, we can rule China together. I just had the rent in my head. Sisters were close. <laughs> it's like, ah. Oh. Thank you for keeping in these undertones of LGBTQ that you never intended to have there in the first place, but we've latched on to. It's appreciated, Disney. Mm -hmm. No press release for this one, though. No official gay moments in this movie. (laughs) (laughs) No first gay female monster cop in animated computer form. (laughs) Or first gay kiss in a Star Wars movie. Or first gay Marvel. This the list goes on. I could have a soapbox about this, also, as you can tell. <laughs> anyway, and a favorite thing. It was really a favorite thing that I appreciated. Okay. Well, should we talk homework time? Yes. <laughs> For next time, in a time honored tradition. Uh, for our fifth year running, please, uh, watch the 
animated shows of 2020. Uh, we are talking about the best new shows that we love and enjoy that came out this year in our next episode. Uh, so watch around, dabble. If not, you'll just get some recommendations from us of what to watch. And yes, there were some new shows in 2020. I know it's hard to conceive, but there were some. As always, we want to say thank you to Nigel Curtino, our sound engineer, and thank you to Jacob Reed and the Champagne Drops for our theme music. You can find our show notes on uh, writersgetanimated.podbean.com, and you can find us on Twitter, at WG Animated, to keep up with announcements of new episodes and maybe other stuff if we post that. I don't know. And feel free to tell us if we're wrong or how much you think we're right. It, either way, it doesn't matter. It's um, engagement, we, and Google likes that. So, <laughs> well, um, we we do not actually wish dishonor on you or your cows uh, or your families. Um, be be well, everybody. I don't know what I meant by that, but <laughs> good night, everybody.